Today we're diving deeper into examples of the three systems we explored last week to help you decide on a turnkey client acquisition process that best fits you and your business. So if you haven't listened to that episode 41 or read the article from last week, you're best to do that first and then come back to this one because that way you'll get the right context to start choosing specific mechanisms. Now, if you're up to speed, then let's go. Welcome to the Leverage Business Podcast, where we believe business success is about working smarter, not harder. Leveraging your time and expertise in ways that fit the digital age you and your clients live in today. I'm your host, Jay Allison, author of Leverage Consulting in the Digital Age and founder of the iSuccess Business Academy. And every week I'll be sharing insights into how you can apply the power of leverage to grow your consulting, coaching, or other expert services business and create true freedom and independent success with mindset, marketing, and money model breakthroughs. Because when you get leveraged, the sky's the limit. Let's go for it. Again, today I am diving deeper into those three systems we explored last week in episode 41. So if you haven't listened to that or read the article, you're best to do that first and then come back to this one because you'll get the right context for what we're talking about today. Last week, I took you through the only three systems you need to achieve a six figure revenue in your business. And these were a discovery system to attract your ideal people you want as clients, a relationship system to nurture those prospects and a sales system to convert them into clients. We talked about picking one method to start with for each uh, for each system that you're going to focus on for, um, for each one to start with so that you avoid that overwhelming feeling of all the different things, spinning plates and the stress of doing too many things and not quite tracking what's working. And last week, we also talked about the sequence, building out the three systems as three steps to keep you on the straight and narrow as you take your customers on a journey through your process to engage, educate and enroll them, be it into your service, program, membership or course. So let's now dive deeper and go into each of the three systems and I'll share some examples, methods you can consider what suits you and your business the most. So let's start with discovery systems that engage your ideal prospects. First, to get people to discover you, to engage your ideal prospect, you'll need an attraction system. So this starts with being clear on what you do or who specifically and with what result outcome. What's the benefit they get from working with you? An attraction system should act like a magnet so the right people can find you and start the process of engaging with you. Either they opt in via a landing page with a juicy lead magnet, giving their name and emails, or they join your social media following or group. Now, you can drive the right crowd or traffic either through organic search based on content you're publishing and make sure that you focus on search engine optimization or SEO and sharing and um, getting people to really uh, use your content, consume your content you can also do it through paid advertising, get in front of a targeted audience. So it might need a little bit of testing out. So I wouldn't lose your shirt over it. Just um, spend a little bit of, of, of money testing out the different uh, keywords, ads, targeting, demographics, etc. to find out what converts the best. Now, paid traffic or leads costs money, of course, but saves you time. And organic lead generation costs you time. It takes a little bit longer for it to bed in, um, but it does save you a lot of money in the long run if you can get that working. So ask most coaches where their clients come from, though, and they'll almost tell you word of mouth or referrals. And that's great because it skips right over discovery and relationship building and makes a beeline for the sale. But here's the problem. It's inconsistent and it's unpredictable. And you need to supplement word of mouth or referral with discovery methods that will fill your funnel and keep it that way so that you've got some sense of control over the whole process. But what we do quite often with um, with new clients is we look at a strategy where they're just going to build on the networks and the spheres of influence that they've already got, because it is the fastest um, straight line to getting a new client to actually making a sale. So what are the kinds of discovery methods that you might uh, think about? So number one would be your blog. 
Um, so you're on your website, you usually have the ability to um, post articles or, or a blog. Um, people often ask, is blogging still relevant today? And that's a question that I get asked quite a lot um, because it's quite a lot of effort, obviously, to produce content every single week, usually. Um, and some will tell you that, you know, email marketing um, and blogging, that they're kind of dead methods. But I would totally say don't believe them. Blogging's very critical for building your audience, but it's also the very foundation of your discovery system. It forms the centerpiece, the hub for everything else that you do online. It gives you credibility. It allows you to be a thought leader. So blogging consistently gives you powerful credibility. Everyone who reads your blog will immediately know that you're the expert in your field. So you think a bit of a little bit as your your thought leadership um, status hub, your resume online. Um, it gives you great searchability. So if you're using SEO strategies, your blog's going to rank well in Google and other search engines, and it's going to put you then in front of your ideal audience. And the most important thing really is it's your own property, your blog and your website, assuming that you have it on a hosted um, domain, not a not a WordPress.com where it's hosted by WordPress. Um, then social media and other discovery methods are really important, um, but they're not yours. So, you know, you don't own Facebook, you don't own YouTube or LinkedIn um, or Pinterest, whatever it is you're using. So, you could potentially uh, lose your access to them at any time, or you could be blocked and have your profile bar removed just by doing something inadvertently um, that got a complaint or something. So build your business on a web property that you own and no one else is controlling it. And here's some keys to successful blogging through, through consistency. You've absolutely got to commit to blogging regularly. So my platform, as you obviously can tell, is um, was originally through writing and I've seen my books out there, but my podcast is something I do really regularly. But I also turn that, as I've said before, into an article. So every every week, apart from the guest interviews, I turn my um, my post my podcasts into posts on my on my blog. So you don't have to blog every day, right? You know, you can certainly do that if you want to do short things. But actually, some of the longer blogs um, are hitting some of those three things, the, the, the credibility, the searchability. They're, they're hitting those in a really big way because there's more chance to, to really get some, some decent SEO going um, on, a, on a longer article than these really short ones. Um, but it really depends as well on how much um, you're creating a following. So it's not that you're getting found by new visitors every week, but actually you're getting found um, and, and people are subscribing and they're, they're, they're following you. So if you do it, um, you have to do it to a set schedule that's going to work for you because a schedule that you're going to stick to. That's really important um, because if you do anything less um, it's going to frustrate your readers and waste time. You're just going to lose people as fast as you're gaining them because they don't know when the next thing's coming um, and they don't know how reliable you are and just sends sometimes the wrong signals. So if you can only do something once a month, at least you do it once a month. OK, so if you do it two, two times a month or, you know, once a week, um, it's just really good to stick to that. So if you brainstorm topics that's going to help grow your audience, they're, they're, they're your subjects um, that the, your market's most interested in. So what I do is take sort of Laura McDowell's advice and, and think about a content plan so that you can think about mixing things up and you can do your SEO research and you can plan everything out. Not too far ahead because you want to be also responsive to what's going on in the marketplace. Um, but it's really good that you're not sort of sitting every single week with a blank piece of paper that you've actually done some work in advance. I think it's really also important to accurately gauge the response that you're getting. So um, I have to say I don't get many comments on my on my blog posts and my, my blog site, but I do get people email me directly um, or submit an inquiry. So I don't know what's quite going on there, but it's an interesting dynamic. The other second method that you might want to use is social media. So that can be anything from LinkedIn through to Facebook, Twitter, um, Pinterest, Instagram, those kind of things. But again, um, I kind of syndicate stuff out to each of those, but I don't spend a lot of time on anything other than my podcast. That's the main thing. And then obviously I promote it through my social media accounts. But I don't spend a lot of time in my Facebook group, for example, which is what I said at the beginning of last week's episode. Um, 
is it's really sort of underused, underutilized, um, and I need to do something about that. But at the same time, for me, it's more important to spend my time getting my podcast out because that's what's generating me um, interest. If you judge, you know, if you're judging by the number of social media platforms that are out there, it's pretty clear that being social accounts for a huge amount of all the time spent online, right? And it's generally not a good idea to base your entire business on any social media platform. Again, as I said before, but it is a necessary part of your overall success. I mean, any business that doesn't have a presence on one of the major platforms is, is really missing a trick. But not all social media platforms are created equal and not all of them are going to be suitable for your business type or your audience. So your market might love Instagram, but completely avoid Twitter. They might hang out on LinkedIn, but hate Facebook. So, I mean, I think this is why I've resisted a little bit doing stuff on Facebook, because most of my leads come through LinkedIn. And uh, sometimes people don't even participate on a personal profile. I mean, not I'm not someone that gets hundreds of likes and comments on my personal Um, Facebook page because I actually use my personal Facebook space for real personal connections, you know, like my family and my friends. So I don't have the maximum 5,000 on there. But but the the boundaries are blurring, to be honest. And uh, I think it's just something to to think about if that's what's going to suit you and your audience. So your job is really here to find out where your market spends most of its time and establish your presence there as well if that's the platform that suits you so start conversations share your blog posts encourage engagement and just simply be visible Um, it's all about discovery this is your attraction system right it's also a discovery system so you've got to make sure your ideal client can find you on his or her or their favorite social sites While you're checking out social media platforms, don't neglect YouTube. Now, it's not been a big platform for me. I do syndicate out to that. And the podcast goes out to YouTube as an audio. Um, And I have done an occasional webinar, but it's really not been my platform. But actually, it's the second largest search engine. And I know I'm probably missing a trick there. um, And it's certainly something for me for the future. So for some types of businesses, YouTube can be really good because it profiles you so well when you're on video. Getting on camera is pretty ideal, but if you're shy, there's plenty of other ways to make video work for you. You know, you can use screen share, you can use slide presentations, photo mon- montages, animations, um, lots of alternatives. But every now and again, it's nice for you to sort of just show your face. I think it's really important that people really get to know who you are. So like other discovery methods, though, video relies heavily on consistency. So don't think you could just create one or two videos and suddenly have a gaggle of YouTube followers. It's not going to happen that way. Instead, aim for creating at least one video per week. Um, Sometimes people do a whole series. They'll do one a day for 60 days and they'll just really commit to that. But it does depend totally on your business. Now, it doesn't have to be a long video either. I mean, last week's podcast, for example, for me was 20 minutes. Um, others have been, you know, around 45, 50 minutes. So, you know, it's better actually with video if it's not, because it's like YouTube isn't a platform that people spend hours watching one single video. They hop around quite a bit. What it does have to do when you send a video out is it's got to provide great information. So structure, clarity, you know, actionable things are really, really tasty for people. So identify the top three social media platforms in your niche and set up or update your account. Make sure your profile is really speaking to what you're all about and what you offer. And keep in mind the subjects that you've brainstormed in the section about blogging, because those are going to be also relevant and you can repurpose content from one to the other in a different medium, which is what I really like to do. So a third method under the attraction system discovering to discover you is free webinars. Now, I'm starting to get a sense that the word webinar, people are getting a bit tired of it. So substitute it for a workshop and something becomes, again, a lot more actionable. And people really like something that spurs them into action. So for list building and sales, you really can't beat the power of a webinar or a workshop that people can turn up to and really engage with you, you know, in a very interactive manner. So instead of one way communication or information, it's um, it's a dialogue. It's a, it's a two way process. So they give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to a previously perhaps unknown audience. You can prove your expertise by sharing valuable information in a very 
interactive way and, and integrate questions and answers. Um, so really get to know your audience as well. So it's really good actually for market research as well, because you'll learn a heck of a lot. Um, and you can grow your mailing list by partnering with a colleague in a complementary niche. So you can start to do things jointly with people and you can make sales through time limited offers. So you build the, the workshop up in such a way that um, you're really helping people to see what the possibilities are for them. And here's a way to help them and making an offer at the end of it. And not only that, but once you've created two or three presentations, you'll always be prepared to speak because whether it's at a conference or a tele summit or a virtual summit, a podcast or, or anything else where your audience is, you can just turn up and give your keynote presentation, your your signature speech. So on the back of that, what I would suggest you do is to create your go to presentation and schedule a free webinar or workshop for your audience. Be sure to have your goal clearly in mind as you're creating the event. Now, closely related to that is another method, which is public speaking. Now, like webinars, public speaking is an ideal way to get in front of your ideal client and speed up the no like trust time. Wherever you're speaking, the audience members are going to feel an instant connection. And if your topic resonates with them, you're well on your way to turning those listeners um, or your audience into buyers. Public speaking doesn't have to mean you get in front of an audience of thousands, of course, you know, and you probably shouldn't, at least not at first. Start small with local business networking events, chamber of commerce meetings and other intimate gatherings. Niche conferences are another great opportunity to get seen, get noticed. Now, if you're not comfortable on stage, get some practice, grow your confidence by joining a local Toastmasters group or taking a Dale Carnegie course or something like that. Just make sure that you're working on that. So don't dismiss it just because um, it's not been something that you've been comfortable at in the past, because I certainly know from school days the idea of doing a presentation. Um, and I ran a communications course at University of Warwick for nine years. And I remember the students were terrified of doing their oral presentations. So I got them to do it in a group and that felt much better for them. They felt more comfortable. Anyway, um, you might also consider working with a speech uh, speaking coach if that's something that you know would be great for you, but you just need to get better at it. So what you can do on, for public speaking then is to research or have your VA research several public speaking opportunities and see really what the lay of the land is there. You need to be looking for local events, niche conferences, meetup groups, virtual summits, that kind of thing. OK, so the next method for discovery for your attraction system is you can publish a book, which is what I did last year. It was the culmination of many, many years of pulling stuff together, um, which was going to be a workbook and ended up being quite a substantial epic manual, <laughs> comprehensive manual, if you like, about um about all this process, really, about these three steps. I mean, I've built it out. Leverage Consulting, you know, had several components in it in a sequence. And that's where the whole flywheel came from. So I created a book around it. And when it comes to getting discovered, there really is no better method than to write a book. It doesn't have to be a difficult or time consuming as you think, and not like my experience. In fact, it's probably a lot easier now for me to write a second book. If you've been blogging for a while or you've been creating content for a courses or you've been kind of just accumulating bits and pieces, you, you're likely to already have a lot of the content that you need. And really, it becomes a process of structuring it and getting organized and then writing it in your own voice and getting the formatting all done and uploaded to your favorite self-publishing platform. Now, I've got a guide on all of that process as well, because it's something that I've taken myself through and taken a few other people through as well. So you can get that on my website. I'll put the link in the show notes. So, I mean, done right, your book launch can introduce you to a whole new audience who are eager to learn more from you and order your, your programs and your courses and your services. The to do for publishing a book would be to brainstorm it, you know, outline what the book would cover, you know, what would be the focus, what would be, if you like, the, the structure, the headings, the chapter headings, just like as if you were building a course, thinking about what would be the uh, the outcome and work backwards from there in terms of the curriculum and the modules. So set aside, you know, at least 30 minutes a day to, to write as well. So that, you know, I would probably say more than 30 minutes, but it depends on how much time you've, you've got available. Don't do it in try and sit down and write for the whole day. It just doesn't work. 
But with, you know, an hour a day, you can easily finish your book in, you know, two to three months for sure. OK, so the next system we're going to look at in terms of methods is the relationship system. So you're looking at methods that allow you to nurture, to educate and to demonstrate that you can help your ideal prospect. So once you've got your prospect's attention, the no part of the oft repeated no like and trust um, process, then you've got to foster a relationship. And it's not enough for a potential client to stumble across your blog or social media accounts or even for her to buy your book. It has to be a maintained contact and has to be that you become the go to expert so they keep coming back to you for, for more sort of good tidbits and insights. And you want to also be turning those chance meetings into sales. And it's really great if you can point to something um, that takes people into um, some content of yours that allows them to see that you can help them. So you've got to move them through the customer journey from engage to educate, basically. So the second step and the second system that you'll want in place is the one that helps you build the relationship. And the relationship system is going to maintain the engage step and educate people on what they're most interested in. And it also demonstrates you're someone who can help them. So what are the methods that you might think about leaning into for your relationship system? Well, the first one is email marketing. I like blogging. Many gurus will tell you that email is dead. In reality, email marketing is very much alive. And in fact, it's incredibly effective and it still is. I think it's dead when you really aren't engaging the person and your emails aren't getting opened. Then you could say, well, it doesn't work. But actually, when you're um, when you're getting it right, it works really, really well. So it's the single best way to stay in touch with your potential clients. So even if you've got it working pretty well and you, you've got open rates of 20, 30, 40 percent, then that's going to do well enough. You know, we're not looking at having 80 percent of people open your emails because I think that just doesn't happen these days. Um, delivery is a big problem. Um, just making sure you've got the right people on the list. Um, people also just change their minds about what they're interested in because they're flitting around. And so it's not the right time for them to be an ideal prospect for your business. But the key thing here really is that you're giving an opportunity for people to stay in touch with you. So you can't simply ask for their email address in exchange for a free gift and then only reach out when you've got something to sell. It's just people just get turned off completely by that. So it, it just destroys any trust that they've got in you and they're probably never going to do business with you again. Um, it's the same with LinkedIn. I mean, it's email, there's a messaging system through LinkedIn and, you know, we, we, we talk about it uh, a lot that you get these connection requests and then if you happen to think, oh, they look like somebody that fits my profile as well and I'd be interested in them and the next thing you know after accepting is they're trying to sell you something and it's just such a big turn off I usually disconnect from them um, so what you can do instead is commit to a regular email series that provides useful actionable advice and little to no selling now that doesn't mean you can never make an offer because obviously you're in business um, but it'll train your readers to expect great content from you and help improve your open rates and the occasional sales pitch is going to be received much better when it's part of an otherwise education based series. Many online businesses are even bringing back the weekly newsletter, giving it a, a nice name and, and making it feel like it's something to look forward to, like a gift every week. Um, so it's like a colourful, information packed email that typically contains several articles and resources, along with a related product section that offers a soft sell. Now, again, the key to this strategy is consistency. So if you do decide to launch a newsletter, be sure to commit to it for at least several months in order to better gauge its effectiveness. And the trick thing to do here is to have an email system, which means that you can set up your weekly newsletter or your series of emails, your nurturing sequence as an autoresponder series or an automation. So you'll never have to think about it again. Once you've got it in motion, once you've created and crafted those messages, you'll be able to send those out regularly to um, to your audience, to your subscribers. Now, obviously, with a newsletter, it's probably something that you'll send out as a broadcast rather than an automation because it's going to be it's not going to be something that you repeat. But it could be something that, um, you know, as soon as somebody joins your list, they get the same sequence. Um, so it depends how much news is in it um, and how much is just a series of 
great content that just happens to have the newsletter title. So the next one I want to just talk about is in-person networking, because um, although a lot of what we do, especially at the moment, has been virtual and online, um, in-person networking, it sounds a bit old fashioned, but actually it can really cement a relationship that begins online. Attending conferences is a fantastic way to meet your ideal clients just when they're ready to make a commitment in their business or their life. So if they've been on your list and they've been receiving your content and maybe they're in a free Facebook group, then giving them an opportunity to actually meet and mastermind and exchange and pleasantries and get to know you on a personal level is really, really important. Business networking events can be productive as well, especially if you live in a large metropolitan area. So check meetup groups, BNI chapters and other organizations for events where your ideal clients likely to attend. I mean, even golf clubs uh, tend to arrange things for businesses, for local businesses, because a lot of their members are businesses. Um, and I've been invited several times to come and speak at the local golf club, which is just like incredible. Of course, they want you to pay quite often, which I tend not to pay for <laughs> my speaking engagements. But, you know, it's just a good way to get in front of the right people. And it's worth testing out because sometimes it can end up being your, your best method. So what you can do is to plan to attend at least three conferences or networking events, say, this year. And just find out whether it's something that really works for you. For attending, make sure that you decide on, again, on the goals for the event, including who you want to meet and what you want the outcome of those meetings to be. I've just had a client who has done exactly that, made some appointments part as part of the conference and although those people were not directly likely to be her clients um, they were able to introduce her to the people that she can get in front of who definitely are her ideal audience so that was definitely a, a method that's going to work for her I think quite well going forward. So the next one um, is something that I do a lot of and that's free consultations. So no networking opportunities in your area, not a problem. You can network in person by providing free consultations. And of course, you can also do it online, which is what I'm still doing uh, via a Zoom call. Um, it's such a tried and true method. And it's one of my favorites, particularly for consultants and coaching looking to grow their business, because that's kind of, you know, goes with the flow of what you do in your professional um, engagement with clients anyway, that that consultation, that asking questions, that deep dive into what the problem is that your prospect wants to solve and how you can help them. So again, it helps you demonstrate that you're someone that can bring clarity and and look at things you know, from an external perspective can be incredibly valuable to people. So not only are free consultations perfect for showing your potential clients how you can help them achieve their goals, but they're also ideal for weeding out the tire kickers, for weeding out the people who aren't such a good fit. And I always have a application process at the beginning of my consult so that they have to fill in some information. So I'm not going to get someone who's not interested because it will take them a good five or ten minutes to actually fill out that application to make sure that they get the get the gig that they actually get in front of me because my time is valuable. I will talk about this uh, later. In, we call it a velvet rope kind of approach, but it means that you can separate out action takers from those that simply want to pick your brain who are not committed to making changes to reach their goals or aren't even really clear on what their goals are. So you can use your free consultations to determine if you really want to work with someone. And now some people call them a strategy call. Some people call them a discovery or an exploratory call. You know, you can give it a name. It's also quite useful to, to name it something around the, uh, the program transformation that you deliver. So for me, I use them for my digital roadmap program. And so it's simply called a digital robot consult. And that's actually a paid consultation. Um, but for my Leverage Business Accelerator program, the free consult is called simply Free Business Accelerator Strategy Discovery Session. Bit of a mouthful, but it really packs in what that session's all about. It's about discovering your strategy so that you can accelerate your business. So that's my free session that sells, so to speak. And of course, true to form, if that's something that you'd like to do to have a free 30 minutes uh, chat with me about discovering your strategy for business acceleration, then I will put the link in the show notes so that you can hop on a call. OK, so 
So if that's something that you think will work for your business, then set up this system, um, you know, to offer short one to one consultations. And you can do that through a scheduling app. I use Acuity Scheduler, but I know Calendly and Schedule Once are also very popular. Um, or you can just have an open office hours or a regular Google Hangout. It's entirely up to you how you deliver the free sessions. So the third system that I'm going to give you some methods to think about is the sales system to enroll your best clients and generate revenue. Now you've got your discovery and your relationship systems in place. The only thing between you and your six figure year are more well thought out sales systems to handle sales, follow ups and even customer support automatically as much as possible to leave you free to continue to grow the discovery and relationship components. Now, at its most basic, your sales system is going to have to contain your funnel. So that begins with the discovery, the top of the funnel, and continues through low cost products and services, your value ladder, if you like, right down to your high end VIP coaching or consulting program. You're also going to need a payment system. So whether it's a shopping card or a simple PayPal button or you do bank transfer or whether you arrange for people to send you a purchase uh, order number and you invoice them, you need a way for people to pay you and for them to receive the goods. And the next thing is a customer support process. And the first step of that is going to be your onboarding process. You don't necessarily need to have a whole help desk and customer support. You just need to be accessible if something if there's a question, um, but you can also put on your website a frequently asked questions page. So that can help direct some follow up messages and help encourage people. But the last thing you want is for your clients to feel they've been abandoned as soon as they make a purchase. So that onboarding that, you know, it is onboarding into a, a program. Then I always talk a lot about access and motivation being incredibly important kind of module zero, if you like, to get people really on board and feeling excited about the decision that they've just made to work with you. So if we look at your sales funnel, first of all, uh, I mean, entire books have been written about sales funnel. So I'm just going to give you the basic idea here. Your sales funnel is going to begin with your free offers. So your blog, social media updates, YouTube videos, that kind of thing, your free content. And those are things that anyone online can access at zero cost. So it's a way for you to get them onto your email list. They're free items that require an opt in. So the cost of access isn't money, but it's an email address and a name. They're actually uh, committing to to receive more from you. So some of the the what we call lead magnets are checklists, worksheets, video training, small reports, resource guides, small actionable things, basically small actionable downloadables that people can easily consume to get a, a sense of what you're about and that it pulls them into more of your material. So below that in your funnel, sometimes um, people like to offer a low cost item. Um, it really depends on your market as to whether this is a right strategy for you. So it could just be a, a trial, like $7 trial of something, or it could be like a $97 mini course or something like that. So it's really up to you to determine what your entry level rate is and whether or not, in fact, you want to have one of those stepping stones in there at all. And next to your mid range products and then followed by the top end, the elite coaching or program type offers. So your sales funnels really ideally needs to work in conjunction with your content system. So your blog and your email autoresponders, they ought to be all moving people towards making a decision around your core offer from top through to bottom over a period of time. That's really what you're trying to move people um, through towards. And one of the difficulties is when people have lots of different offers or their offers not clear, it's not actually clear to the consumer what they can buy from you. And then you find that people opt into nothing. They buy nothing. So if you find that people are opting in to your free offer and they buy your low cost items, but don't purchase your higher end products consistently, you have what's known as a leaky funnel. And it simply means that buyers are escaping your funnel at some point. Now, it could be that they're just not the right people for your high end offers, but it also might mean that your low end offers are really not attracting your high end people. So you've got to identify where your trouble spots are so that you're closer to earning what you're worth. So draw out your sales funnel. You can use, you know, PowerPoint or you can use some mapping tools like Geru. 
with your free offer at the top and that's your opt-in followed by whatever comes next. These different touch points are incredibly important part of your customer journey and I'm going to say a lot more about mapping out that customer journey and tracking what's working um, in the next week's episode. So do your email messages, follow-up marketing and other information. Work together to move your buyers through the process. Have a little think about what the alignment would look like, what the sequence would what work would work for you, for your customers, to moving them forward. So the next thing that you might think about doing is putting on a special offer. So when a visitor lands in your cart, so to speak, your relationship with them has reached a new level. You know, if they're going to buy from you, you're in a perfect position to offer more in terms of an upsell or a cross-sell or a one-time offer. Now, you'll see this in action quite often with online products. Um, So if you're a consultant or a coach and you offer something a bit more nuanced than a product or a course, then it might be that this won't necessarily work for you. But what does work is if you're selling a, a package of some kind and that there's different levels that you can have that package. So one example would be to have a group program with add on coaching. So something that is like a VIP version of the same thing. What you'll see actually sometimes on Amazon um, or, or supermarkets even is before you click the buy now, you'll often see a row of items with the heading customers who bought this also bought or you might also be interested in. And I think that's definitely something that is being underutilized in the online space because it really does encourage buyers to explore other related items and also to understand what other people like them also buy. So it increases your average revenue from one customer. Now, you can do the same in many of the common shopping carts available today, the the online tools that you can buy. But even if your sales system doesn't have that option, you can just easily add a few related items to the checkout or thank you page or even follow up in the thank you emails that come. What happens if a customer lines in your cart and doesn't buy? So that means your sales system isn't really quite working. Maybe they decided that the cost was too high or that they're not quite ready for your product or program. And that's the perfect opportunity to offer a downsell. So a lower priced item in the same kind of category or niche. And your downsell might be a light version of the item that they almost bought. Or it could be a self-study version uh, rather than a live training. Or it could be an ebook instead of an online workshop. So it's making those kind of alternatives. And again, you're repurposing the same content. You're just thinning it down, slicing it off or turning it into a different medium. The point with a downsell is to turn a no into a sale, even if it's a lower price point. It's much easier to sell to a customer than it is to sell to a visitor. So once they've bought something from you, if the downsell converts, it's a powerful tool to be able to offer them something else later on. So consider all of your products and programs and services and think about, again, how they align in your customer's journey and what they need to build that know, like and trust factor. And if it makes sense to add a downsell and to add an upsell, an upgrade. And then what you can do is track where your people are buying and where they're not buying and see if that makes a difference. Now, the other part of the sales system, which I think is often glossed over, is customer support. Because from the moment of purchase onward, and really even before, your clients and customers deserve the best support that you can offer them. You want them to have a really good experience with you. And it begins with product delivery. So whatever they've decided to buy, you know, which we've already covered, you've got to continue with the follow up and the encouragement and and really get them excited about the choice that they've made. Now, one of the ways to do this is either through a one to one private call or to do a group welcome meeting just to have a help desk kind of automation. Begin by incorporating a series of emails that encourage clients to both use the products they've purchased, but also participate in any groups or other live training available to them so that you can really feel that they're part of a community of practice. One coaching program does this by requiring mastermind members to complete a questionnaire by Friday afternoon each week. And one of the questions is, what was your biggest accomplishment this week? The following Monday, the entire group receives an email listing the upcoming events and detailing everyone's greatest moments from the previous week. And this keeps members engaged and makes it far less likely they'll drop out partway through the year. I have another client who's doing 
pretty much the same thing through email messaging as well to really make sure that everybody's taken care of and that they know what they're doing, when they're doing it and how it's going. You can offer encouragement to your members, buyers, clients when your program's actually running live or is even a self-study approach. Simply set up your emails in an autoresponder to go out on regular schedule and your clients and customers will be much more likely to not only complete your program, but to recommend you to others and to purchase other courses from you as well. Your help desk is an important part of your customer support system as well, even if you're running it yourself. But by providing fast, courteous help, you'll build a loyal fan base that will happily sing your praises and refer new clients to you as well. Whether you maintain your help desk via email or with a dedicated app such as Zendesk or Help Scout, take the time to set up a frequently asked questions page and it's going to help your buyers find the answers they need without having to wait for you to respond to easily answered queries. So for those questions that do require an answer from your team, canned responses can easily take care of probably 80% or more of the tickets that you receive. And not only that, you can and should craft your responses to gently nudge your readers more deeply into your funnel. So to do this particular method, you've got to create a frequently asked questions page, set up some kind of help desk or an email help alias so that there's one thing that all your emails go to, like support at jallison.com and ensure that your buyers aren't being left in the dark after they purchased. Now check your follow-up sequences, make sure that they can be improved where possible and keep an eye on what's coming up in the questions to then keep adding to your frequently asked questions page. Those are some solid systems that can really transform your business, but more importantly, give you the sequence that creates consistency so that you've got a continuous stream of visitors and leads and clients coming through into your business. And if you're not earning that six-figure salary that you deserve, chances are one or more of these systems are not working quite as they should be for you. So perhaps you've got a lot of traffic to your blog and your social media, but you're not getting a lot of sales. And that would be an indication that your relationship building system needs some work. Now, if engagement's rocking, but you're not making sales, it's time to look at your sales system. If your sales system's good, but you want to increase your profits, I mean, who doesn't, then a good hard look at your funnel is probably in order. Also check your pricing points for your different programs and products in your value ladder. And you can also check that your follow-up system is really working so that if your customers buy once, that they're likely to buy again. And of course, if there's no traffic at all, then you can trace each and every client back to a referral. Your discovery system likely needs an overhaul. Now, I do want to stress that these three systems work best when they're tightly integrated with each other. And that's why I represent them as a flywheel in my leverage business system, which is, again, the image on the front cover of my book. A discovery system alone can't bring in clients. It won't be efficient or consistent. A relationship system will help grow your list and build your audience, but it'll be slow going if you don't have a great discovery system in place to keep filling that funnel. Now, take a look at your overall business. Identify those areas where each system could use some sprucing up. Now, whether your social media accounts are outdated, your blog looks like a ghost town, or your sales funnel is as leaky as a piece of cheesecloth, then take the steps needed to tighten those systems up and you'll be well on your way to earning that six-figure revenue in your business. If you want to go beyond six figures, what are we talking about here? So yes, you can ramp up the three systems that we've just talked about. But as I said last week, you're going to hit a ceiling at some point. So what do you do after that? So just wanted to finish off really by talking about a little bit about that. Now, given how consultants and coaches like us are experts, we're established in our field, we have an existing network of professionals and that we're also by nature probably high achiever types, ambitious, hardworking. The six figure goal really should be a very achievable income, right? And we're not asking for the impossible. So why do people struggle? And the answer is that we're reinventing ourselves quite often in the digital arena. There's a lot of things that used to work for us that aren't working anymore. And there seem to be an an awful lot of new players and the new competition and differentiation becomes increasingly more difficult to stand out. So there's a lot that's different. And so therefore we question how we're going to stand out and if we're good enough even compared to others in a way that perhaps we never did when we were networking in person. 
And sometimes you get tempted to drop your prices to attract more clients. Well, that's going to take you in the opposite direction to the one you want to go in. So maybe you're thinking about creating a new offer or working in a slightly with a slightly different type of client. Maybe you're shifting or innovating in some way, or maybe you're just not charging what you're worth. And don't forget what my lovely guest Gaynor Gosden shared about leveraging your R&D back in episode 20. Uh, Because some of the research and development you do to deliver your services digitally may well mean you're eligible for tax relief. This just came up in a client conversation the other week. In fact, somebody in Canada, and it kind of reminded me that there's these R&D tax relief systems set up in most countries, not just in the UK. And you can get a significant rebate if you make a good claim. Now, as a successful independent consulting or coaching business, you should be aiming to hit multiple six figures or seven figures and beyond. So next week, I'd like to take you into the future so that you can plan ahead and look at forecasting and tracking so that once you've got something working, you find ways to scale it, to increase your influence, your impact and your income. So I'm really looking forward to diving in and tackling that one for you. Any questions, um, make sure that you submit a question on the podcast page, which is jallison.com forward slash podcast. There's a little box further down. And also, if you'd like to be a guest, there's an application section on that page as well for you. So that's all for me for now. I shall see you next week. Well, we'll be creating a business dashboard for tracking customer journey and looking at data analytics with a view to what you areas you can scale. So I shall see you next week. That's all for me. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Leverage Business Podcast. Want to create leverage in your business? Did this episode provide some insights and ideas to be thinking through? If so, subscribe so you get alerts when the next one's released. If you want to learn more or would like help and support with building a leveraged business that achieves true freedom for you, then head over to jallison.com forward slash podcast to find all the resources and links that go with this show on my website and to join our iSuccess community. And if you're enjoying our content, it would be great if you could pop into Apple Podcasts or the app you listen from and leave me a rating and review. Everyone makes a difference to improving our rankings. So thank you if you've done that already. I appreciate you. So, hey, that's it. Thank you for listening. I hope you've loved this episode and have some great takeaways to be thinking through. I wish you a pleasant, productive and profitable week. And I'll see you again next time for another episode of the Leverage Business Podcast.